Uh, now, a few days ago, talking about, since we're talking about religious liberty, last year around this time, Donald Trump signed a bill to eliminate churches and pastors being penalized for speaking out on political issues uh, who were under the 501c3. Now, that was last year around May. It was the National Day of Prayer. Now, the National Day of Prayer came around again this year. And just a few days ago, a day or two ago, Donald Trump signed another bill. And I want you to see, for just a few moments, what he signed. Because of the implications that we find very, very clear in Bible prophecy. Now, I want you to look with me for a moment. And I want to show you this right quick. Okay. Do I need to... Uh, I'm sorry. It's me. I know what to do. Is that there? Is Bill is there? Okay, good. Okay, good. has done such an incredible job. Paula? Paula? Stand, Paula. Thank you, Paula. And the president of the National Day of Prayer, Dr. Ronnie Glory. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Can everybody hear? I especially want to recognize Sissy Glenn. And I will now add that word Lynch because I always call her for Sissy Graham, but it's really Sissy Graham Lynch. You like it that way better, right? Don't you think we all like it that way too? I like it that way because you learned from a great gentleman. Fantastic man. So Sissy, thank you very much again. We really appreciate it. Very nice. Priest Narayanachar. opens us the treasures of God's mercies and blessings. All is beautiful. And when he said it, it meant so much. And when I say it, he helped me, but I like when he said it better. Right? I think he did that a little better than I do. <laughs> Reverend Graham's words remind us that liberty and faith has forged the identity
Americans of faith have built the hospitals that care for our sick, the homes that tend to our elderly, and the charities that house the orphaned. I'm the minister, and they really do. They minister to the poor and so beautifully and with such love. We are proud of our religious heritage. And as president, I will always protect religious liberty. We've been doing it. We've been doing it. Last year on this day, I took executive action to prevent the Jackson Amendment, a disaster, from interfering with our First Amendment rights. I was so proud of that. I've been saying from the beginning, you know that. And I was saying for a long time, we're going to do that. Across the government, we have taken action to defend the religious conscience of doctors, nurses, teachers, students, and groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor. In January of this year, I was proud to be the first president to stand here in the Rose Garden to address the March for Life, a very special day. And my administration has spoken out against religious persecution around the world, including the persecution of many, many Christians. What's going on is horrible. And we're taking action. We are taking action. We condemn all crimes against people of faith. And today, we are launching another historic action historic to promote action. religious freedom. I will soon be signing an executive order to create White House. The faith, thank you very much. The faith initiative will help design new policies that recognize the vital role of faith in our families, our communities, and our great country. This office will also help ensure that faith-based organizations have equal access to government funding and the equal right to exercise their deeply held beliefs. We take this step because we know that in solving the many, many problems and our great challenges, faith is more powerful than government, and nothing is more powerful than God. With us today is a living reminder of this truth. His name is John Ponder from Lockheed. Now, um, if you want to go. In, Ameri in American politics from the time of George Bush. George Bush was in office the Office of Faith-Based Initiative Program, where the George W. Bush created a faith-based initiative program where he brought the churches and allowed the churches to receive government funding. But Donald Trump has gone one step further. He has created a wing for a face-based office in the White House, which had never been done in the White House. But faith-based programs is, this, is the, on one hand, it sounds good. They have good intentions, but it will lead, but it's leading, it's foreshadowing a union of church and state. And at the same time, it's a subtle undermining 
of the U.S. Constitution. And for what, for what you just heard, Donald Trump said, I will be sure that the churches receive adequate what? Funding for their programs. Now that sounds pretty good, but we know in the early history of America, that was not always the case. But I want to talk, call you to a point in Great Controversy, page 445. I've, you know, there are good people in, those, in, the, in some of the other churches. And we are also told that many of God's people who will actually accept this message and be part of their loud cry are not among us as yet. But when they hear the message, as it should be, many of them will make their stand with God's people. But in Great Controversy, page 445, I believe this is what I'm looking for. I'm trying to see because this is, it might be different. That's what I'm looking at here and this one here, but I'm going to see. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a bit, it's much different here. Uh, let me see if I have it in. I'll see if I come to it. I'm going to quote it for now. It says, the, the image of the beast will be formed as the Protestant churches seek the aid of civil power for sustaining their institutions. And, and I, it says, says now I, I don't want to misquote it. Uh, does anybody have a great, a, a great kind of verse? I want to talk about, look at page, uh, it's 445 or 588. I want to make sure we get that before we get started. Let me be sure. I think it's 445 on one. Because they, they come together on points they have in common. And then right underneath that, she talks about the idea. Now, I think I have it in a PowerPoint as well, but I'm trying not to go there just yet because that's a different one. When the leading churches of, as they have in common, Sean Flus, now listen to me. They, first of all, they unite on such points of doctrine as they have in common. On October of last year, they said the Protestant Reformation, or the protests, was over. Tony Palmer started it in 2014, 20, coming along. Then by 2015, and then we, by, we watched in 2016, we watched uh, the evangelicals uh, and others begin to say that the protest is over. Now, suddenly, Donald Trump has made an announcement that he has started a faith-based initiative office, a wing in the White House, which had never been done in the history of the nation. These are not only historical markers, but these are fast-fulfilling signs that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. But what's even more fascinating is that these prophecies are being fulfilled based off of Daniel and the Revelation that we as Seventh-day Adventists have been preaching for the last hundred and some odd years, along with the teachings from the spirit of prophecy in the great controversy about what will take place. Listen again. Read it one more time. When the leading churches do what? Where are we at? Now, am I, uh, am I exaggerating? Is, is the news exaggerating? Now, this is not fake news, by the way. Because there's a lot of fake stuff out there, and you have to be careful. But at the same time, it's a wake-up call because we're, we're heading towards the fulfillment of what we just read. Now, listen to me. The issue in this final battle is that we need to go home. Seventh-day Adventism is a movement. We are our denomination by name. And we read the testimonies of the church, God gave us the name. But we are a movement heading for the heavenly Canaan. 
We are strangers and pilgrims. We do what we can to reach out to communities, to share the everlasting gospel, to help the oppressed and the poor and the downtrodden. Yes, we're supposed to be doing all those things, but we are not to forget that we are heading towards the heavenly Canaan. And if the plan of salvation for the redemption of mankind is drawing near, to the, bring about the restoration of the image of God. The purpose of the gospel was not just for you to come to church on Sabbath and know that you keep in the seventh day Sabbath. The purpose of the gospel was for you to know your God and know how to commune with him and in delighting yourself in the things that he delights in and, and having joy reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, praying to God, and beginning to know that God does hear you and will answer you, will forgive you when you sin, and will give you power to resist your sin and to stop it, and show you how to walk like Jesus walked. And, give it, and when you feel weak and when you can't deal with it, you're not by yourself. When you're dealing with temptation, you're not fighting the temptation by yourself. That's why 1 Corinthians 10, 13 said, There is no temptation taking you but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not subject you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, let's break it down for just a moment. You're tempted. It's a sin that you, you seem like you just can't shake it because it's part of your nature. Or it's a hereditary tendency. Oh, it's been cultivated over the years. It's enamored almost in your flesh. But yet through the power and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because God didn't tell you to stop sin on your own strength. Because you can't do it. The carnal mind is not subject to God, neither indeed can be. That's why you must be born again to have the battle to gain victory with sin and resist it. If you don't have it, you can't do it. This is, that's the basic ABCs of salvation. Without me, what is John 15, 1 through 5 says? I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that bear fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Do nothing first is not talking about the strength to get a home, a house, or a job. Do nothing is dealing with, without me, you can do nothing to resist your nature, your hereditary tendencies. Without me, you don't have power to, 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 to change your mind about how you feel about another person. Without me, you, can't, you don't have the ability within yourself. If you could do it yourself, then you wouldn't need a plan of salvation. You wouldn't need redemption. But without me, you cannot make the changes. Oh, yes, you can go to positive thinking clinics and you can go to behavior modification specialists, but that does not change the fact about your sinful condition. You need a power outside of you that can come into you, that can actually transform you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Without me, ye can do nothing. So when you put it together, I can do, there you go to Philippians 4.13. Now what does it say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So there is no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. Why? Because if I'm abiding in Jesus, I can do all things. I, through Jesus working in me by his Holy Spirit, I can stop. I can stop the habit. I can break the chain that Satan has bound me on since a child. 
I can be healed from the, from the abusive relationship that my father or my mother did to me. And sometimes, before you study prophecy on some things, you need to have a moment of reflection about your own life. And, I, and ask yourself, why am I not comprehending? Why am I not really caught up with the word of God like I should? Can it sometimes be a psychological issue of, 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 of uh, how you say, what's the word I'm looking for? A psychological issue where you have unresolved conflicts based on issues at home that started from childhood that affected you all the way through your life, even after conversion. Because just because you converted doesn't mean that you're not affected. The issue is, what's your attitude towards it after conversion? And if you're really asking God for the Spirit of God to take possession of you. This goes on sometimes. This is why in the church when people come in, some want attention on everything. They want to be in everything, but they want to be up front. They want everybody to see. Why do they want everybody to see? Is it, because they, is it, is it really because they really, they're, 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 they're pompous? Sometimes some of them are, but some are not pompous. But it's because when they were young, they didn't get attention. Now they have achieved something. Now they have a little status. And now they want the attention that they didn't get in childhood. And unfortunately, they somehow let their own nature rise from time to time in the occasion when it should have been crucified. Sometimes it's when you say, I, I, I'm not going to take this anymore. Well, if you're dead, you didn't feel anything anyway. Dead people don't talk. What did the Bible say? Come on, what did the Bible say? Did the Bible tell us that we're supposed to be alive or dead? The Bible said you're dead, right? Dead to who? What are you dead to? So wait a minute. If this man is dead, and I say, now he's dead. Okay, you're dead. Remember this, son. And if I say to him, man, I don't like that suit you got on. Man, and that, and that shirt, I would never wear that shirt with that type of suit. And, and, and why don't you shave sometime? What's wrong? Why don't he react? But how is he dead? Is he dead because he's just dead, or is he dead in Christ? Because only if he's dead in Christ Will he not respond? But if he's tried to dead, die himself, and he thought he had self pretty much down, then he will rise up again. And say, so what you say? You talking to me like that? How can you accuse me? Because he professed to be dead, but he did not die with Jesus. When you die with Jesus, you don't respond no more. If people hurt you, you go to God on your knees. You don't go trying to give them a piece of your mind. And if they keep abusing you and you know it, you go to God even more. And you come back with a good attitude. And you work with them anyway and they look at you strange like, I know I did it, I know I gave her a good one and she's still over here smiling. Oh, yeah. You even offer some water for them. You even do good to them. Hey, I, I made this for you. For me? After what I did to her. Why? Now, I'm talking about practical Christianity for just a moment. Why? Because redemption transformed you. Jesus changed your nature your inner man, and you no longer have the attitude. You no longer are so sensitive. You no longer sit there quabbling and going home complaining and, and, yawn, and yakking about what this person done. When you're born again, when you're 
truly converted. But as long as you're on the throne, there will be conflicts and strife. Because when wisdom from above comes, it's pure, peaceable, and easily to be entreated. But wisdom that's from beneath is what? Earthly, sensual, devilish, and full of what? Strife. So when you sit there and you're dealing with the conflict and you're trying to figure out which person, which, which, which spirit is going to control you, the Holy Spirit or the spirit of a devil, all you got to do is look at the conversation and engage for a moment. What am I saying? What is going on? And what, wis what wisdom in the wording is talking? Is it from above or is it from beneath? If you're so hot-headed and so mad you can't control yourself, guess where you at? Guess who's controlling you? The wisdom from beneath, earthly, sensual, devilish, behind the scenes, every soul that's not fully surrendered to Christ is under the control of a what? Another power. But you don't believe that because you believe you're in control because I, I, I can't handle this. Jesus didn't tell you to handle it. Didn't he tell you, come unto me? All ye that are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek. Now, how are you supposed to handle it? I am meek and lowly in heart. But if I become meek and lowly in heart, didn't they walk over me because they think I'm a fool? But that's because you're thinking about I. And I is self, and self supposed to be dead in Christ. That's the only way you can deal with it. Because there are people in this church that will make you go out and actually roll up your fist and start fighting. There are people you, I'm just telling you, I'm, busy, there's, there's no, I'm not going to play with it. It's true. But what restrains me? The love of God restraineth me. The spirit of God restraineth me. He convicts me of sin, righteous and judgment. You can't talk that way. Don't go to him with that attitude. Don't talk to her that way. Sit down, sit down, go somewhere, go for a walk, go pray, come and talk with me. And then when you have talked with me long enough and, you're, and you get your senses and your reasoning back, then let me reason with you on how you will deal with her. That's what God's trying to do with us. Because we can talk about prophecy all day. We can talk about the image of the beast for me. And when that issue comes, guess what's revealed? Your character. And the issue will be, do you have fruits of the spirit? Are you dead to self and sin? Or are you alive? Hmm? You don't want the mark of the beast, but it's the beast in you. Hmm? I need to ask you that first. We're going to talk about this other stuff, but I'm, I just want you to see that. But go with me now to Revelation 14, 9. Revelation 14, 9. The Bible says, And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead and his hand, the same shall drink of the what, everybody? The wine of the wrath of God. The, the same shall drink of what? The wine of the wrath of God. Now, I want to talk about this, and I want to talk about it in light of the third angel, three angels' messages, all right? Because we've got a lot to cover, and we're going to cover some things tonight. We've got a lot to do for the rest of the week. But I want to give you an idea of why we're going into this as we talk about the introduction here. I want you to watch this with me for a moment, all right? Nope, no, hold on. Should have came on. Anything happening there? It's coming on a minute. Hold on. Death of his father, hence the year here mentioned, was the second year of his reign. Ah, okay, hold it. No, it's not it. Okay, keep going. All right, let's go here. The Bible says, can you, can you read that? Can everybody see that? Yeah. All right. The third angel's message of Revelation what? 14. All right, let's go there. 
The Bible's a question I'm asking. Now, we're doing this in question and answer form. This is a study tonight as we go through it. What event marks the proclamation of the third angel's message? What event marks the proclamation of the third angel's message? Go with me in your Bibles if you got it, Daniel 8, 14. You have it on the screen for some of you who, don't, who, who, don't, who didn't bring your Bible, and I want you to see with me. In Daniel 8, 14, the Bible said, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the what, everybody? The sanctuary be cleansed. I want you to note, at the end of the 2300 days, Jesus would move from the what? Holy place to the what? Most holy place of the what? Heavenly sanctuary. Now, there's one book in the Bible that gives us the origin of Adventism. Now, I shared a little bit yesterday, but I'm going to go into a little more detail as we compare this issue, because it's not enough to read the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White's writings are not supposed to be actually used to interpret the Bible. She gives commentaries and she gives comments on certain things that are spiritually there. But at the same time, her writings were not made for you to sit down and say what she said and not go back and search the scriptures and prove your points from the scriptures. You cannot use Ellen White when you're going out here knocking on doors and witnessing the people about the real ish truths and doctrines of the Bible. You cannot use Ellen White when you're sitting there contending with a first day minister about the Sabbath. You cannot use Ellen White when you're dealing with certain type of spiritualists who also are contending with you about the issues on the state of the dead. You've got to be able to know your Bible well enough and be competent enough to know your Bible, not only knowing Bible text, but knowing background, knowing the humanitical structure sometimes, knowing what is a, what's relevant and what is not, and knowing how to bring the past history and make it relevant in the present and understand that the type and anti-type are the same. And you have to understand that. It is not hard, but you must take time to discipline yourself in order to do it. The greatest teacher for a man is not just a man that stands there teaching him, but the greatest teacher of man is when man makes up his mind that he's going to discipline his own life and take control of his mind and begin to educate and, and discipline his mind to learn and to study. And so I want you to know that at the end of the 23 days, Jesus would move from the what? Holy place to the what? Most holy place. This is, this, okay, this was called the what? Cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, how do we know that did with the issue of the cleansing of the sanctuary? Is it because my note is there? Go back to Daniel 8, 14. What did Daniel 8, 14 say, first of all? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the what? Sanctuary be what? Cleansed. All right. Now, we'll talk about the actual cleanse, what went on if we go to the Old Testament. But first of all, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. What sanctuary is going to be cleansed? I want to know. Huh? I want to know. Sorry about that. Notice, Dan does Daniel describe this event that took place? Now, wait a minute. Daniel told us the sanctuary will be cleansed. Does he describe the event, the actual event of the sanctuary? But before I go there, I want to know from John, because we're going to look at Daniel and John, we're going to see how Daniel and Revelation conjointly go together. I want to know, does John talk about the same thing that Daniel talks about? Because, and I want to know, if, first of all, what sanctuary? Because a few years ago, there was a man in 1979 and 80, his name was Desmond Ford. Desmond Ford, I, I checked most of our theologians in those days with the teaching was there, there's no sanctuary in heaven based off the Plymouth Brethren theolo theology of his time that he studied. He was a brilliant man in Australia. He was one of the most profound teachers that we had in Avondale College. I went to Avondale College and I went there and I visited some places and I saw even in Avondale Colleges the writings of Desmond Ford and I began to look at them and examine carefully how he came up with certain positions. Then I thought about this, and I thought about this, and then another man came on the scene named Walter Brinsby. And I looked at his situations too. And I began to see these men were brilliant. I said, how could such men with brilliant, talented men like this, how could they come to a point where they begin to doubt the word of God and even cast doubt upon the spirit of prophecy and then raise their, 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 their questions with, with, with the fundamental teachings of Protestant evangelical theology 
and pose a threat to rejecting the Advent message. And not only a threat, but they actually led a lot of people away from the message. And many in Australia thought that when he would come here that, we would, that people would deal with him. And many here almost lost their faith in the same time. But a simple study of the Bible would have helped us greatly. Especially when he said, was question issue of a sanctuary in heaven. Go with me to Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 for a moment. But before we go to Hebrews, go to Psalms. And let's, go, and let's take a look at something. Let's look at two areas. I'm going to look at two things. Let's talk about, the, let's connect the Advent movement to the issue of a sanctuary that's dealing with the issue of judgment. Let's put it that way for you, all right? Now, you're going to have some things right on the screen, but I'm going to take you to some place. Go with me, first of all, to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. I want to start there because chapter 10 is the foundation for the Advent movement. Everything in this chapter has something to do with the Advent movement. From its history down to its doctrines, when you study it carefully. Look what the Bible says in Revelation 10, 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a what? Cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of what? Fire. Now, for review, yesterday we found out something about this angel. I said, who was this angel that's going to start the Advent movement? First of all, the, the, the Advent did, when John says another, that means that he saw some angels previous to this one. What angels did John see that was previous to Revelation chapter 10 of the mighty angel coming down? John saw the angel that had the sixth, the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpets that will be blowing, that will, bring, that will begin to be the, the final signs that's going to bring in the Advent movement. And that's why he said, I saw another angel based on Revelation chapter 9 and chapter 8. Are you with me now? And if you study, you're going, we're, we're, and we're, we're, we're going tomorrow night, so you know, tomorrow night we're going, to look up the, we're going to look at Islam in Bible prophecy. Does Islam pose a threat to religious liberty? We're going to find out tomorrow night. But tonight, now remember, what's going to be tomorrow night's subject? Islam, all right? But tonight we're going to look at part one of this one, and then we come back to it on, on Wednesday night. Watch carefully now. But now, in Revelation 10, the mighty angel, who's the mighty angel? What did the angel have on? His face is as the what? Sun. All right, go me to Revelation chapter 1, and let's look here at verses uh, 12 through 16. The Bible says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girded about with paps and a golden girdle. His hair and his head was white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes was a flame of fire, and his feet were as fine brass as it burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the what? Sun shineth in his strength. Whose countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength? Based on the context of Revelation. It was Jesus, one like who? The Son of Man. So wait a minute. Jesus' face was as the sun. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Let's go again. Look at the Bible, do the explanation. It's not what I think. It's not what you think. It's what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says in Revelation and in Matthew 17, 1. And after six days, Jesus take up Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bring them up into the high mountain. And it says, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. Whose face or countenance shined as the sun? Jesus. So wait a minute. Who is the mighty angel that's going to start the movement of Adventism with a little book in his hand? That is Jesus himself, the founder of Adventism. Not Ellen White, not James White, not Joseph Bates, not A.G. Daniels, not even William Miller. But Jesus himself starts our movement. Now, first of all, before we go any further, Listen to me. The angel came down from where? Heaven. I gave you two Bible texts yesterday. You remember those two Bible texts I gave you yesterday? I won't say if you never took any notes. You remember two Bible texts I gave you yesterday? Go with me back to, I, go with me to Psalm 66. Psalm 66. And let's look here at verse 24. The angel came down from heaven. I want to know what's in heaven according to the Old Testament test history first of all. And then we'll see the New Testament. Go with me for a moment. The Bible says here, that Bible says in Psalm 66, 24. Psalm 66, 24. The Bible says here, they have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings. 
Psalm 68. I'm sorry, Psalm 68, 24. Thank you very much. Psalm 68, 24. Thank you so much. I'm glad, well, I'm glad y'all paying attention. That's good. The people were asleep. They just would have said, I, what text did he say? And they would say, kept on. But y'all, that's, um, that's good. All right, good. Psalm 68, 24. Y'all ready now? It says here, they have seen thy, what everybody? Thy, oh, thy goings, O oh God, even thy goings, my God, my king, where? Where was God's goings? In the sanctuary. Now, by the way, if we want to know the way to God for money, if we want to know the what? Way to God, go with me to Psalm 77, 14 for a moment. Psalm 77, 13. Psalm 77, 13. Thank you. The Bible says now in Psalm 77, 13. Y'all ready? Come on. You there? You should be there. Come on. I'm going to make sure you got looking at the scriptures with me. Are you now? That's how, this is how I came into church. You know, they brought me in like this. And I remember I remembered that evangelist, R.C. Connor, back in the day. All right? Are you with me now? The Bible says what? Thy way, O God, is in the what? Sanctuary. Now, let's put it together. First of all, David said, thy goings are where? In the sanctuary. And the Bible said, the way to God is in the what? Sanctuary. So now the, now, the Old Testament is telling you that God has a what? Sanctuary. Is that right? Let's go a little bit closer, though. Let's look at Psalms 102 with me. Come on. Psalms 102, I believe it is. Let me make sure I got that one right. I, I remember I gave you that one. Is it 102.19? Yes. Psalms 102.19. Are you there? Come on. Are you with me now? Are you sure? Yeah. All right, come on. This is Sunday evening. You got time. All right, come on. All right, come on. You ready? The Bible says here in Psalms 102, 19, 20, 102 what? Did I say 19? Yeah, 19. It says, for he looketh down, for he has looked down from the height of his what? Sanctuary. Now, listen carefully. He has looked down from the height of his sanctuary. Where, everybody? In heaven. Now, connect with me for a moment. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. But now, what's in heaven? A sanctuary. And, so, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven or come down from the heavenly sanctuary. Let's break it down again. An angel is a what? Message. And a messenger. Are you with me now? It's the Greek word angelos. Are you with me now? So now, and I saw another mighty angel. Or I saw a message. And a messenger. Whose face was as the sun. His feet as fine brass. And his voice as the sound of many waters. I saw this mighty messenger with a message. Coming from the sanctuary in heaven that is the goings of our God and the way to our God. Are you with me now? And then he says here, let's go a bit closer. And he says, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven having what? Ha clothed with a what? Clothed with a what? Clothed with a cloud. Now, why is this here there for a moment? Let's talk about that for a moment. Why is he clothed with a cloud? What is, you, got, you, know, you know anything about a cloud? You know, now, who's the angel, first of all? Jesus, isn't that right? Jesus is the mighty angel. But now he's clothed with a cloud. You know anything about a cloud? The presence of God was in a cloud in the ancient Israel time. He was, a pillar, he was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by what? Night. And he was leading Israel. This is demonstrating, first of all, that Adventism is being led as a movement just like ancient Israel was when they were coming out of Egypt. Now, let's, look, let's go a bit closer, though. You know what they was about a cloud? The Bible says over in uh, Psalms 50, verse 3. No, no, let's go to this one. Go to Matthew 24, 30. Wait, Matthew 24, 30 first. In Matthew 24, 30, the Bible says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, there's a problem here. Revelation 1, Revelation 10, 1 said, a cloud. Revelation 1, Revelation, Matthew, Matthew 24, 30 said, clouds. Now, which one is it? Go with me to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Come on. So you can see something. You ready? Come on. Acts 1, 9 through 11. I want you to talk about, talk about a cloud message. 
sanctuary message has already been established, and we're going to look at it a little bit closer. But a cloud message is there, too. Look carefully. In Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, are you there? And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up out of their sight. I'm sorry, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their what? Sight. And while they looked steadfast to heaven, he, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gaze up into heaven? For this same Jesus, who you've seen go up into heaven, shall so come as he what? So shall come in what? Like manner. How did he go up? In a cloud. He will come back in a cloud with clouds. Are you sure? What Bible says you got to prove that clouds are angels? Go with me to Psalms 104.3. The Bible says in Psalms 104.3, Who layeth his beams of his chambers in the waters. Don't miss this. You ready? Come on. Psalms 104.3, Who layeth his beams of his chambers in the waters, who make up the clouds his what? Chariots. Now, wait a minute. What are clouds now? Chair. Chair. No, nah, they didn't say angels there. You can't go there yet, sister. You're going to get there, but you got to build. You got to build there. You can't jump the gun because if you do, you get presumptuous and you can get shot down if you continue for your faith. Now, first of all, the Bible says, who left his beams of his chambers in the waters to make the clouds his what? Chariots. Now, what are chariots? Now, let's go to Psalm 68, 17. Psalm 68, 17. Come on, because I'm coming back to our PowerPoint in a moment. Let's get, let's try to get you up for the, get you up to speed for a moment. The Bible says, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. What? The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels, and the Lord is among them as in Sinai. So how many angels came down with Jesus and God the Father when, he, when Jesus spoke the law on Mount Sinai based on patriarchs and prophets? 10,000, 20,000 times thousands of thousands. And when will the next time God visit the earth with clouds and angels? It will come at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Right now, the angels are still working with God's people and working with this church. How do you know? Because in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says, Are they not all, talking about the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister unto those who shall be heirs to what? Salvation. What is salvation, by the way? Deliverance from sin. Did it change? Did God change? Malachi 3, 6 says what? I am the Lord and I change not. Isaiah 57, 7, 15 through 17 says, And with him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God doesn't change. He's not wishy-washy. He's not flip-flopping. He's not fickle. Let's go a bit closer. And so we find... A cloud message. Now break this down for me now. Go to Revelation 1-7. You quote this one all the time. Now I want you to break it down. We, I gave you both the links. Now break it down now from the Bible with me. Come on. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Come on. Now, I, 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 now come on. Let's go. Come on. Behold, he cometh with what now? Clouds. And every eye shall see him. And they also which Pierce him. Now, what are clouds? Behold, he cometh with 20,000, even thousands of angels, and every eye shall see him. And they also, is Revelation 1 7, they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth. That's kings, potentates, politicians, rich men, poor men, black, white, Jew, Gentile, Protestant, Catholic, atheists, shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. 
Now you're with me. Now, so what's the cloud message dealing with? Second coming of Jesus Christ. But the cloud message has one other thing with it. And then I'm going to take you back to your PowerPoint. Because I'm just going to show you a little bit, a little bit of time because I give you too much, you just you, you get overwhelmed. And you say, oh, pastor's going too fast. I didn't know that. No, no, I'm not going to do that to you this time, all right? I know what's going on with you. All right, let's go a bit closer. All right, let's go to our next point. Now, the Bible says that another cloud, the cloud message, so we have a cloud. So watch this. You got, you got a mighty angel message because the angel is a messenger. We're going to go, we go deeper into that later. But you have a cloud message now. You have a sun message. Now, let's talk about the sun for a moment. In Revelation 1, the mighty angel's face was as the sun. Is that right? And we saw in Revelation 10, his face as the sun. What does sun represent? Let's take a look. Go to Malachi 4.2, right quick, come on. I gave you to see before. Listen, it's, when you're preaching and teaching, it's not, it's not a sin to be redundant a little times or repeat something. Because oftentimes, people don't always get it. But you need to sometimes go over the game so it can make a deeper impression on their minds. In, in Malachi 4.2, the Bible says, But unto you that fear my name shall the what? Son of righteous arise with what? Healing in his wings. Now, wait a minute. Who? Wait a minute. Who is going to rise on his wings? Son of what? Righteousness. So, what is righteousness? Psalms, go to Psalms 119, 172 first from the Bible. Psalms 119, 172. My Bible says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness so wait a minute what's the sun message a message on righteousness not just on the commandments alone but whose righteousness Jesus because Jesus is the son of righteousness let's go a bit closer though all right whose righteousness go to Philippians 3 9 Philippians 3 9 in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, look again with me. Come on, you went over this yesterday. This one, this went over this point yesterday. Come on. Are you there? Come on. No. Philippians 3, 9. The Bible says here, and, and being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So what's your son message? Righteousness by faith. What's your cloud message? What's the, what's the message, that's, where is the message coming from? Heaven. And what's in heaven? And so what you have, you have a sanctuary message. You don't believe me? Go to Hebrews 8, 1. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. And let's read verse 1 and 2. And Hebrews chapter 8. Now we went to the Old Testament for sanctuary. Now we're going to New Testament. Let's be sure. Are you with me? Come on. In Hebrews 8, verse 1 and 2, the Bible said, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest that is set. Where? On the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Where? In the heavens. Now we have such a what? Who's this high priest? Now you say, Jesus, what Bible text you got? I'm from Missouri. You know, they have the old saying that I'm from Missouri, show me. Show me where it's at. Don't even tell me tell me because Ellen White said it. Don't be telling me because so and so said it. Don't even say it because I said it. I want you to show me from your Bible. And I want you to give me the text. Sit there, tell people stuff. You know, we with, with little huh? Go to Hebrews 414 with me. We come back. We come back to six twenty. In a minute, keep we keep your finger there. I'm gonna see what you got. All right, Hebrews four fourteen first. And let's see if and let's see if this text will complement what we what we what we're gonna find. Hebrews four fourteen says, "Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who is he?" According to Hebrews four fourteen, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Who's your high priest? Who told you Jesus was your high priest? 
The Bible then. What Bible? My Bible? My Bible? Your Bible. You're not going home with me. You're going home with your Bible. You're going to go home and read it again from your Bible. That's why the Bible said in Acts chapter 17, you must go back and see and search the scriptures to see whether those things were so. Are you with me now? So Jesus is a great high priest, right? He's a high priest where? In heaven. But what's in heaven? But that was the Old Testament, brother. We have New Testament Christians. Go to Hebrews 8.2. Let's answer it back. Hebrews 8.2 says what? A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Uh-oh. Now, wait a minute. It's one thing to say a sanctuary. It's another thing to say a true tabernacle. Now, watch this about the true tabernacle. It said, which the Lord pitched. Meaning this tabernacle was in existence before Moses built here. Lord have mercy. You don't get it. This tabernacle, this sanctuary, this place where your high priest is was built long before Moses would see it in the mount. And it's pitched by God. It's not made by human hands. It's the original tabernacle. When Moses was in the mount in Exodus chapter uh, 40, I believe it is, Remember that? Y'all remember Exodus chapter 40? Some, some, some of you don't read Old Testament, I forgot. Some Adventists only stay in the New Testament. You better read the whole Bible. Because there's stuff that you need to know. In Exodus chapter 40, watch this. I believe it's where, where it talks about, it said, and he said, see thou uh, make it according to the pattern. Is that verse what? By the way, I believe it's uh, where it talks about he took the ark, but he tells about the idea that, he, that Moses had to make it according to the pattern that was shown him in the mount. What verse is that, Lord, I'm thinking about? Huh? It's Exodus 40, but what verse I'm thinking about? 21. And he brought, now, okay, now 21 gives us about, about the tabernacle. Let's go to verse 19 and 20. We can look at it for a moment. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent above it, above, upon it, and as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he took and put the testimony into the ark and set the staves in the ark and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, set it up, set up the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the table in, in the tent of, it says, of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward towards the veil. And he set up the bread in the order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he put the candlestick in the tent in the congregation over, the, over against the table on the tabernacle on the south side. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar in the tent and says in the congregation before the veil. And he burnt the sweet incense therein as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hangings of the door of the tabernacle. And he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the congregation in the offering. What are we looking at? We're looking at, we're looking at how the whole sanctuary was being set up. But this was an earthly tabernacle with earthly priests and they used animal sacrifices. But the animal sacrifice, though it was good to be offered up in faith, could not remove sin. So God had to have a better sacrifice. He would call for a better offering. And back he would actually decide that once a better sacrifice would be provided, then he would provide a better sanctuary with a better high priest. And this, and with the sacrifice of the high priest that, would, that would be, the high priest would be using, he would have better blood. 
how much better was the blood? The blood would be so much better because the people would not only get forgiveness by faith, but this blood, this blood can not only bring pardon, but this blood can do something that the blood of bulls and goats could not do. This blood can blot out sin. Now, when I say blot out sin, I'm not talking about just put a little blotch on it. This blood has the power to eradicate, erase sin from the books. This blood has power to forgive sin that was on the books. This blood has power to pardon sin that had been on the books and the person asked for the forgiveness and turned away from his or her trespass. But this blood has something else. This blood has the power to remove sin not only from the record, but eventually from your mind. When the day of atonement shall be complete. It's one thing to have your sins forgiven and go home with Jesus. But how would you like to be in the how would you like to be in the cloud and you're looking at Jesus and he's looking at you? And you're thinking, man, I hope Jesus don't remember that sin I did in 1972. <laughs> now, I know that sounds a little sarcastic, but I want you to understand. How can you enjoy a place of beauty and purity, angels of God, beautiful scenery, and suddenly, man, mm, did he think about, and you're walking with Jesus, and you, you think you're going to have paranoia when you walk with Jesus. The plan of salvation is revealed in the sanctuary. And the plan of salvation in the sanctuary shows that Jesus' blood is going to blot sin out and we're going to go through a time of anguish down here, trying one day to remember our sins and cannot. Why? Because your sins have been blotted out and put sent to the land of forgetfulness. And when you get your immortal body, you will not have the remembrance of the sins you did, but you will see something that will always give you a reminder that sin costs something. The redemption costs something. You'll see the nail prints in Jesus' hands and his feet. And when someone asks him, Lord, what are these nails in your hands and feet? And he'll say, I was wounded in the house of my friends. That's the remembrance of sin you will have. But your little personal sins that you did in 1980, 1920, 2017, 2015, those sins will not be brought to mind if your name remains in the book of life and you're saved in the kingdom with an immortal body. That's the beauty of this plan of salvation. Now you can listen to all the preachers you want to tomorrow morning. And there's some good preachers, don't get me wrong. But they, you don't, they don't have this. How many people would die to hear and know with, beyond, with a certainty that sin will be blotted out? And then one day they're going to go to heaven with no thought. Take their crowns off their head. Realizing their minds are clear. No guilt trips anymore. No regrets about what happened in the past. And take a crown off their head and with joy because now they feel the, they feel the, the, the fragrance and the, and the animation of, 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 of a body that won't get sick. It won't die. It won't age. It won't get old. And now they take off their crowns off their head and they say, Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. God be the glory. Hallelujah. That's what they're going to say. Why? Why? Because for the first time in this, in, in this issue of sin and the great controversy as it finally ends and, and, and sin is no more, they finally realize, I got eternal life. I'm not going to die anymore. We're not going to have the pains anymore. There's no more cancer. There's no more sickness. No more hospitals. No more graveyards. Family chains now have been reunited. My, 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 mama. 
you don't understand the joy and the animation that will come over you when you start realizing you have eternity, eternity, eternity. You're not going to die. You have eternity. You're not going to get sick. You're not going to, you're not going to, you're going to be able to fulfill your wildest dreams for the glory of God. Eternity. There's nothing like it. We have yet to understand. That's what the Bible says. For the, for the carnal minded man, eyes have not seen, nor ear heard. The things that God has prepared for them and love him. But that context is for carnal minded man. For you, your eyes by faith have seen a land far off in the distance. By faith, your eyes have seen a place that sickness and death will be no more. By faith, you've seen a place where, 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 where you can... One day, live in peace. You won't have to pay rent anymore. You won't have to work all day long, eight hours on a job and, and punch a clock. And you, you can build and not another plan. By faith, you've seen a better land. Beulah land, they used to call it back in the day. I'm headed for the Canaan land. I hope one day you will understand that. Now let's go to this last part as we close out. For last point, now Jesus, now look it out, in Daniel chapter 7. Now remember, Christ was in the what? Heavenly sanctuary. For 18 centuries, from 8031 up to now, up to 1844, Jesus was in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, by the way, Paul wrote the book of Hebrews in A.D. 65. Five years before the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, why would that be important in the study of the issue of the sanctuary for a moment? Go with me in your Bible to Daniel chapter 9. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9. And by the way, what was that text you gave me earlier? Okay, before we go to Daniel 9, go to Hebrews, what, Hebrews 6.20? Hebrews 6.20. I want to make sure our brother gave us a point. I don't want to, I don't want to miss it. All right, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20. When I asked about who was the high priest, y'all remember that? And whether the forerunner, okay, here we go. And whether the forerunner, now he gives a good point because what he's about to bring up is eight. Watch this. Hebrews 6, 9 is written in AD 64. Now, Paul is telling you, we asked the question, who's the high priest? Paul says that Jesus is the high priest. We read that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. But now Paul goes also to show that he's a high priest, but he was the what? Forerunner. Look what the Bible says. And whether the forerunner is for us, what? Enter. Even Jesus made a high priest after forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek had no beginning. Now, by the way, when it says no beginning, there was no trace of the record of when he was installed as a priest. It is not saying that Melchizedek is Jesus. Because I know Adventists try to say Melchizedek was Jesus, okay? But according to the scriptures, Melchizedek was a priest, but they had no other record of when he was installed as a priest. And it had no record when he ended as a priest. But he was a, pri he was a priest for who? Of Salem, which means peace. He was a type of Christ as high priest in the days of Abraham. Won't you get the point? But now let's go back now. What Bible text did I give you? Daniel what? Daniel 9. Go with me back to Daniel 9. I asked the question. I told Paul wrote the book of Hebrews when? 8060 what? 8065. Are you there? Come on. Daniel 9. Won't you see it with me? All right. In Daniel 9. Look here for a moment. Now, I want to show you something. I want to find in this chapter, I want to find where something's mentioned about the temple. The Bible says in Daniel 9, and it says, look at verse uh, 24. I believe 27. Look at, 20, look at, look at 26. Chapter 20, Daniel 9, 26. And after three score and two weeks, shall the what? Now, everybody's reading with me. I want you to make sure you're there. I don't want you to miss this. And after three score and two weeks, shall the what? Messiah. Messiah. Who's the Messiah? What's the Messiah mean? Jesus. What does the word Messiah mean first? It means anointed one. I ask you, who is the Messiah that was anointed by God? Jesus. When was he anointed? At the baptism of John the Baptist. Okay, 27 AD. Watch carefully. But let's go a little closer for a moment. Go back. The Bible says here, 
And that, it says here, uh, and after three score and two weeks, so the Messiah will be what? Cut off, but not for himself. And the prince of the people shall come. And shall what? Destroy the what? City and the sanctuary. Now, wait a minute. Question. Which sanctuary? Earthly sanctuary. Who was the prince of the people that destroyed the earthly sanctuary in Jerusalem? Who's the prince, people of the prince? Who is it? It was Titus of Rome who came and destroyed the earthly Jewish tabernacle. Now, why was the Jewish tabernacle destroyed now? Because Jesus had told them already, because of their rejection of the Muslim being Messiah, that your house is left unto you desolate. And then, according to the prophecy, he would be cut off in the midst of the last week, which was the 70th week, and in the midst of that week, he was crucified. And then three years later, the 70-week prophecy would meet fulfillment in AD 34, and Jews would be cut off as a nation being God's chosen special people. They can only be saved that they accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That's why you have Messianic Jews today. But as a nation, they would no longer be God's chosen people. And the Jews, some of the rabbis, curse the book of Daniel dealing with the 70 weeks. Talking about your, may your bones rot and all kind of stuff. Because that chapter deals with the Messiah. Let's go now. So Daniel says Jesus, that Jesus in 8031 entered the heavenly sanctuary. 18 centuries he stayed there. Then Daniel 7, 9 says what? And it says, does Daniel describe this event that took place in 1844? Watch carefully. It says, and I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the age of days did sit whose garments was white as snow, and his hair of his head was like what? Pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as what? Burning fire. Daniel 7. And then, Daniel, go, go to verse 10 in your Bible. Go to verse 10. And it says here in Daniel 7:10. Everybody there? Look carefully. Daniel 7:10. What's it say? And a fiery stream issuing came forth before him. Thousands, thousands ministered to him. The judgment was set, and the what? When was the judgment set? In heaven at the end of the what? 2,300 days. When did the 2,300 days start? Under the third decree of Artaxerxes Lamanatus. There were two decrees prior to that, but under the third decree, under Artaxerxes Lamanatus, that and it was to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be what? 69 weeks. Isn't that right? What's the complete prophecy? 70 weeks. Now, we're going to go more in detail with that later. All right? But right now, I just want you to see with me. Now, when the judgment would be set in the books of heaven and the books open, what book of the Bible does Jesus bring down to start the Advent movement? Come on now. Come on. Come on. Go to Revelation chapter 10. Come on. That's right. Little book. Come on. Revelation chapter 10. Let's go. Revelation 10 says... We're going back to Revelation 10, so you can see the movement and you can see it step by step. Now, first of all, prior to the move, prior to the Advent movement, is Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary? Prior to 1844, prior to the prior to William Miller, is Jesus in the sanctuary? What evidence do we have that Jesus is in the sanctuary? All right, now this brother says. Because Jesus was among the seven candlesticks. Okay, we'll go with that, but I already gave you the evidence. What evidence did you have that Jesus was in a heavenly sanctuary? So at the right hand of, of God, where? And the sanctuary of heaven. Oh, a sanctuary of heaven. Okay, and this is before 1844, before. 
A.D. 34. He enters the sanctuary in A.D. 31. Now, what part of the sanctuary did he enter in A.D. 31? The holy place. Now, when, when, will he, when 1844, what's he going to do? Move where? Most holy place. But where both his holy place and most holy place at? Where is it at? In heaven. Where? In the sanctuary. All right? Just wanted to make sure you understand. All right? So now, when he moves into the most holy place, he now enters into the final work of what? Okay, wait a minute. He's at the right hand of God doing what? Go to Romans 8.34 with me. Go to Romans 8.34. Come on. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that what? Died. Yea, is what? Risen again. And who's, who is also what? At the right hand of God, who also maketh what? Intercession for us. Now, why is that important to you? Because when you sin, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Who is faithful and just? This high priest who ever lived to make intercession for us. This high priest who you talk to by faith, he's able to make what? Intercession for us. When you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness on one condition. If you confess with the motivation of intent to put your sin away. You don't believe it? Then Proverbs 28, 9. Go me to Proverbs 28, 9. Okay? Proverbs 28, 9 says, no, no, I'm going to go there next. Go, go to Hebrews, Proverbs 28, 13. 28, 13. We're going to come back to 9 in a few moments. Proverbs 28, 13 says what? He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. Now, wait a minute. What does it mean to cover sin? Hide. What is, how do you hide sin? You can lie or you just don't have to confess it. Or acknowledge it to God. You know, this, do you know there's some sins you cannot tell other people? No matter how much they say, come on, tell me, girl, I can tell you. You know I'm your friend. There, there's some things you cannot tell another human being. You've got to go to God. And when somebody, that's why gossip is so deadly. Because sometimes you done told somebody something that you didn't want to go out. And instead of that person keeping their mouth shut, they went out, girl, did you hear? Man, let me tell you. But at the same time, you know we ought to be like the congressmen when they're under the news. You ever seen congressmen or people who in the news and, and, and they have brought the court? They said, uh, 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 Mr. So-and-so, wait, what, can you please tell us what happened? Uh, no comment. Uh, can, can, can you please uh, tell us, uh, uh, where, uh, no comment. Uh, did, did you really do that to your wife? No comment. Uh, uh, we ought to become the same way in the church. Brother, did you hear about so-and-so? No comment. Well, listen, uh, I, I just heard, no comment. You ought to get to where you can say, no comment, and then say, did you pray for him? And if you didn't pray for him, no comment. They said, we can pray, and then say, let's pray right now for him. And then pray for him right now, and they said, well, but you know, but no comment. You ought to get to the point where you can just say, no comment. That's right. You know why? Because then you're not guilty of gossip. And you're not going to spread rumors. It is not he said, she said. No, no comment. So when, when I ask you tonight, are you going, do you know that so-and-so got the, you ought to tell me at the door, no comment. So if I shake your hand and I ask you a question, and it sounds like I'm about to gossip, what you going to say to me? No comment. So get ready. You don't, I don't know who I'm going to do it to yet, but I hope you remember, no comment, Pastor. All right? Thank you. All right, let's go to our next point. Y'all think I'm playing. I'm serious business. I'm very serious. Look here. Now, so when we pray, and we come down to the altar, when we're praying in the, in the pew, what's happening? When you're at home, and you're praying by faith to Christ in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, what's happening to your prayers? How do you, by the way, how do your prayers go up? I see some people have been studying with me. Go with me to Psalms 141. I want to know how your prayers go up. Psalms 141. Now, y'all shouting out answers, but you're not giving me no Bible text. Okay? Come on. I'm from Missouri. What? What do you, what do, you do from Missouri? Show me. All right? 
Look what it says. Psalms 141, 1 and 2. I want you to say, Lord, I cried unto thee. Make, hear, make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as an evening, what everybody? Sacrifice. How do your prayers go up? When you read the Spirit of Prophecy, she said your prayers go up. She said there was a minister one day that was praying for a dear saint. And the saint wanted this person, this minister, to come and pray for her because he believed he was a man of God. And he was an Adventist minister. And he came to pray for the saint. Well, the saint prayed, and the minister was praying. The spirit of Ellen White was taken off in vision. And she said, in the vision, she said, the minister's prayers didn't reach the ceiling. While the saint, the dear saint that called him over, her prayers went up like incense to God. And God answered to prayer. And the saint thought it was because the minister prayed for her. But the minister was not necessarily living in harmony with God's will. He was not connected as he should be. And his prayers were not going past the ceiling. When we don't live what we preach, some of our prayers are not going nowhere, nowhere, no matter how long you pray. Because you will not confess and put away or seek to truly have the relationship and the connection you're supposed to have with God. Let me give, 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 give you a good example of that. When you go back and you read your Bible carefully, prayer is communion with God. That's also connected to walking with God. All right? But let's go. Your prayers go up as what? Incense. When? When? Every time you get on your knees and you sincerely talk to God. But now watch this. If I'm breaking the commandments and I got iniquity in my heart while praying, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. All right? Now, Proverbs 28, 9 said, he did turn away his ear from hearing of the law, even his prayers of abomination. So you got to think about that as well, all right? But now, this is 23 days. What happened? 457. What happened? 457 B.C. The decree goes forth by Then, 8027, the Messiah comes, right? Baptism of Christ, anointing as Messiah. 8031, crucified. 31, four, three days later, resurrected. By day of Pentecost, 50 days later, he becomes anointed. Because the anointing from heaven spills over on their Pentecost and the disciples are filled with the Holy Ghost in the early reign while Jesus has been anointed as your high priest to begin his work as your advocate, your mediator, the only mediator between God and man. And the representative of Christ on earth is not Pope Francis. It is the Holy Ghost. Okay? So now... Let's go a little closer. Now, Daniel 7, 9, and 10, right quick. Daniel 7, 10 says what? It says, a fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands, times and thousands ministered unto him. The judgment was set, stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the what? Books were what, everybody? The books were open. How does John the Revelator describe the scene? Go to Revelation eleven nineteen. Did John see the same thing that Daniel saw? That's what we want to see. Did John see the same thing that Daniel saw? Now, let's go closer. And, Dan, let's, right, and I, and I got to explain a little book for you. Ready? Ready? Daniel 11, Revelation 11, 19 says, And the temple of God was opened where? In heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his what? Of his testament. And there was lightning and voices and thundering and, and an earthquake and great hail. But wait a minute. What did, Dan, what did John see? He saw the temple of God what? Open in heaven. What's this temple? What's the temple? It's a sanctuary. The sanctuary is also called something else, so you can understand exactly what it is. Go with me for a moment, because we call it sanctuary, we call it holy, holy of holies, we call it all kinds of things, but, and the Bible gives those expressions, but I want you to notice very carefully what the scripture says this was. Notice very carefully. The sanctuary, it says, and the temple of God was open in heaven. We saw that, right? Go with me for a moment to uh, Revelation. Please, that's what I want. Let's see something. Uh, in Revelation, 
I want you to look at, I want you to see where he finds, anybody remember anything about the tabernacle of the testimony? Revelation 15, I think it is. Yes, go to Revelation, let's, let's look at Revelation 15, I think it's 15, I want. It says, it's a glass of mingled, and then it says to the servants, and then it goes on and says, the holy of holies. Yes, yeah, right, go to Revelation 15, 5. It says, and after this, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. What was open? Now, in Revelation eleven nineteen, it's talking about Christ entering the most holy. In Revelation 15, when the tabernacle is seen again, probation is closed. And, and the wrath of God is about to be poured out. In Revelation eleven nineteen. It's the opening for the understanding of the Advent movement of Christ and the and answer to the disappointment of 1844. That's, it's, the, it's the entry, not the exit, in Revelation 11. How do you know? Look at Revelation 11.1. 1. Revelation 11.1. 1. Come on. Somebody read it for me. I want you to read with a loud voice with them. Come on. Uh-huh. Okay, now notice, why, why was this given? Look at Revelation 10, and look here at verse 8 and 9 with me. 8, 9, and 10. Because we're talking about the Advent movement. And Revelation 11, 19, is giving you the answer for the disappointment that we're going to read about just now. And a voice, which I heard from heaven, spake unto me again, said, Go, take the little book. Now, what's the little book? Daniel. Daniel. What part of Daniel? Because I'm going to close you on these points, but i got to lock you in so tomorrow night you'll be ready. All right? What's the little book? Now go with me. Come on. Look back at Revelation 10 and look at verse 2 with me. Come on. So you can understand. The Bible says in Revelation 10, 2, and he had in his hand a little what? A little book open. The little book was what? Open. All right? What book in the Bible? Now if the book was open, that means it was closed. What book in the Bible was closed? Ah, 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 ah. Don't, don't, don't just say Daniel. You, 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 can't, you can't just say Daniel because you're telling your... Oh, so you're, when something's closed, that means you can't understand it. So you're going to tell me you can understand Daniel chapter 1. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you out. You, I know you're going to give me the right answer. But I'm going to show you why you don't say just Daniel. You've got to be specific. Is it Daniel chapter 2? Well, I know, Daniel chapter 3 about the Hebrew boys and fiery furnace. That book was closed up. You can't understand that. Oh, no, Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar pried and humbled down and ate grass like an ox for seven years. Surely, that's a prophecy there. He ate grass for seven years. That can, you, you can't understand that. Oh, I know, Daniel chapter 5, when the children, when, when Belshazzar had the feast and praised the gods of gold and a bloodless hand rolled on the wall, that, that, that's the one that was closed, right? Because you can't understand what meany, meany, take or your friends have meant. Oh, okay, okay, come on, let's stop playing. It's Daniel chapter 6. <laughs> because uh, because uh, they, 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 the decree was given that they worship no other king for 30 days but the O king. Oh, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> let's stop. Daniel chapter 7, that's, yeah, chapter 7. Yes, because they got all those beasts, all those strange beasts. A lion with two wings, a beer raised up on his right side with three ribs in his mouth, and a four-headed leopard. Man, surely that's got to be chapter and because it had a little horn. And then in verse 25 it said, and he shall change times and laws. And it shall be given to his hand for a time, time divine of times. Ha! Huh. Go with me to Daniel 8. And he said unto me. Now, let's go to verse 13. I'll give you 13 and 14. You get the, get the picture. You ready? Come on. Are you there? Are you there? Yeah. All right, let's go. Y'all ready? Come on. Listen, I enjoy what I do. I really do. I enjoy talking about the Bible. I enjoy talking about basic Bible, Bible prophecy. I enjoy what I do. Believe me, I have joy studying the Bible. All right? Okay, if the Bible was bored, you'd be like, turn me to Daniel 12. No, it's not like that with me. Sorry. 
All right, Daniel 8, 13. Then I heard one saint speak to another saint. And watch this. And the saint, it says, it says, I, then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said to another certain saint. The word certain is a Hebrew word. Certain saint is a Hebrew word, and the phrase means the one who is called the wonderful number. It's the Hebrew word palimony. And it means, Daniel 8, 13. It means the wonderful number. Do you know anybody who's called wonderful in the Bible? In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of what? Peace. Boy, I tell you. Mm-mm-mm. It didn't come y'all in. Huh. That's Jesus. Yeah, that's Jesus. You got it right. That's, that's Jesus. That's <laughs> Jesus. All right, let's go to the next point with me. Come on, you ready? Look what it goes on. It says, it says, how long shall be the vision? Watch this. Then I heard once, it says, how long shall be the what? What are they asking now? How long shall be the what? Vision. Of the what? Concerning the what? Concerning the daily, the word daily, the word sacrifice supplied and should not be part of the text. It goes on and says, it says, the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Now the Bible foretells a time when the heavenly sanctuary is going to be replaced by a power that's going to trotten the high priestly ministry of Jesus as your high priest underfoot. And while doing that, they're going to, trans- they're going to trample down and blaspheme the host of heaven. The host are the angels. And the sanctuary itself is going to be trodden down by this power. And then he says, how long? How long will it be? And he said unto me unto 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be what? Cleansed. Now, go with me to Daniel 8, 26 now. Because this is the little book, along with Daniel 11, that was shut up until the time of the end. Watch carefully. Daniel 8, 26. And the vision of the evening and mornings, which thou, which was told thee is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision. What vision was dealing with evening and morning? Only one in Daniel 8. In the context, it was the 2300 days. The 23 days, the 23 days vision of the evening and mornings on the 2300 days. Evening and morning being the what? First day, but in prophecy a day stands for what? A year. But the visions of the evening and mornings of the 2300 days shut down up. Watch carefully. Listen carefully. It says, it says, wherefore shut shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for what, everybody? Many days or what? Many years. How many years to be exact? The 2300th year of the Day of Atonement. When the 2300th year of the Day of Atonement comes, the book prior to that Day of Atonement, when the high priest will move into the Most Holy, that on that 2300th time, day, then the knowledge of this book will be open. But prior to that, you will get a fulfillment of knowledge increasing. Look at Daniel 12, 4. Come on. Daniel 12, 4. But thou, Daniel, can I let you go? Come on. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words, seal up the book, even to the time of the what? In. When is the time of the end? 70 Adventist? 1798. What's going to happen in 1798? The knowledge of the books of Daniel and the Revelation will be made known. You will finally understand. And then you will also see knowledge increasing in the industrial world. But first and foremost is the understanding of Daniel Revelation. Why? Because now, prior to 1798, the Protestant Reformation was formed. The papacy was now having a problem with a man named Martin Luther in 1517. And then he had another problem with a man named Zwingli, and another man named Melanchthon, and another man named William Tyndale, and another man named Miles Cloverdale, and others who began to translate the Bible into the language of the common people, taking it out of his dead languages. And for the first time, the people would now study the Bible for themselves. But a certain event happened to the papacy that caused everybody to go back and search Bible prophecy in 1798 when Napoleon birthed in 1798 when Napoleon Bonaparte 
marched on the Vatican. General Berthier walks in, takes Pope Pius VII prisoner, and declares the Vatican a republic and cuts off the political power of the papacy. The wounding was not the Pope being put in prison. The wounding was the taking away of his political status and power. The church still stood, but it had no political clout. And from 1798 up until 2018, the papacy has been working through the Jesuits and through other organizations to bring about a unity that would bring her political clout, bring back her political power, and give her the fact that she can once again rule the world. For she ruled the world for 1260 years during her time of reign until God said she would receive a deadly wound. And when the papacy fell, nobody understood. And when the Bible was translated into the language of the common people, then the people begin to say, men who begin to read the Bible begin to say, what caused the papacy fall? For when the papacy fell in 1798, it was like the Twin Towers in New York City. It was earthquake. What? How did Rome, she ruled the world for 1,206 years. How does a power, how does an ancient power fall who ruled for over, he ruled longer than Babylon, ruled longer than Medo Persia, ruled longer than Grecia, ruled longer than pagan Rome. How does she fall and receive such a deadly wound? This made the people go back and study the scriptures. And when they studied, they found Daniel 8. They found Daniel 7. And when they found Daniel 8, 14, they begin to wonder. And one man found it who was a farmer and who was a deist. His name later, later he got converted when he was challenged on the fact, is the Bible really true or not? And he began to try to disprove the Bible. But in the Bible, he found the loveliness of a savior named the Lord Jesus Christ. That man was William Miller and he got converted. Amen. When you read this history and story, but for the background. So now watch this. But he said, what do you say? And the vision was for many days. Many days were the 2300 days. Now, what happened? The book was what? Sealed. But was anything else in Daniel closed up till the time of the end? We know Daniel 8, 14 was closed up. But something else was closed too. Go to Daniel chapter 11. Come on. About to clear. You're going to go home in a moment. Come on. The Bible says, right quick. Are you there? The Bible says in Daniel um, 12, go up in Daniel, uh, Daniel, Daniel 12, and let's look here for a moment at verse 8. Because he just gave you the 1260 again in Daniel 12, 7. Then he says, and I heard, but I understood not. And he then said, I, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Now what chapter are we looking at? 12, 12. And in Daniel 10, 11, and 12 are together. It's a continuation. Look carefully. And many, but now the verses, because on events, are not in chronological order. Because I'm going to show you something. And it says, many, it says, go that way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white, but the wicked shall be do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Who's going to understand? You come back to that tomorrow night. It says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination which make up desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and three score, three, a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed he that waiteth to the what? And come up to the thousand three hundred and thirty five days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shall rest and stand thy lot where? At the end of the days. But what did verse 9 say? Go thy way. For the words are what? Closed up and sealed to win. So it's time in 1798. So after 1798, the knowledge of the books of Daniel and Revelation will become unsealed for you to understand the prophecies. Especially Daniel 8. So what little book did he have in his hand? Daniel, but it's Daniel 8. And part of 11. Eight was for the beginning of the Advent movement to point the people of God to the heavenly sanctuary and not only to the second coming. Because before Jesus can come in the clouds, 
He must come in the clouds of heaven to the time of judgment. Then after he finishes the work in the judgment of the most holy place, he will then come with all the angels in heaven that we talked about in Psalm 68, 17. And then, and then, the advent will take place. You get the point? Now, how do we know that Daniel 12 is not in chronological order? Because if these verses in chronological order, then that means, that means that the book of Daniel would not be understood until after Michael stands up. Is Daniel, Daniel 12, 13, is that the last verse or the last fulfillment in the book of Daniel 12? That fulfilled from 508 to 1843. The 1290 fulfilled from 508 to 1798. The 1260 fulfilled from, from 538 to 1798. So if these time prophecies meant fulfillment, then what's the last thing, what's the last two things that's going to happen? At the end time, Michael will what? Stand up, cease his work as high priest, he will deliver everyone found written in the book. Where are they? Many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, others some to shame and everlasting contempt. When will this happen? After probation closes and there's no more high priest because Jesus now will come in the clouds of heaven. But God's people who have been faithful will be resurrected to witness the event with the rest of the living righteous. When I say God's people faithful, I'm not talking about all the righteous of all ages. I'm talking about those Seventh-day Adventists who died in faith of the third angel's message. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, except the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their works do follow them. Do you know what resurrection you're supposed to come up in? Tomorrow night we'll talk about it, but I'll give you this much. It's not the first resurrection. It's the special resurrection. Because you lived proclaiming the gospel, the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages. You lived a life of self-denial and self-sacrifice to develop Christ-like character and to share the gospel with others. You lived for Christ as a gospel medical missionary or as a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Your reward if you die is that you are to be resurrected to witness the coming and you will stand with God's people who have gone through the time of trouble without the intercessor and at the end of the sixth plague and the seventh plague, you are resurrected if you're sleeping in Jesus. You will be resurrected to stand with them to hear God's covenant of peace to those who have kept his law and you'll hear God the Father give you and those who were living who never saw death. And all you who were sealed since 1844. You will stand there to hear God say. The day and the hour of Christ's return. And that's why when you read the book Great Controversy. He says soon our eyes turn to the east. And we saw a dark cloud coming about the size of a man's hand. And as it got closer and closer. The cloud became a beautiful white cloud. Folding itself within and without with fire. And a promise. And upon it was the angel saying holy Holy, 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 holy. The earth moved in silence. Storm and thunder and tempest was everywhere. God's elect stood there looking, saying, Lo, this is our God. He will save us. This is the Lord, and we shall be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That day is approaching. We have this Hope burns within our hearts. Hope for the coming of the Lord. It's coming. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. How many want to be ready? Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your mercy and grace. Help us to get ready for your coming. Keep everyone safe as they go home tonight. Many go back and search the scriptures and who took notes. 
Many go back and reread the great controversy. Many go back and reread the scriptures and the prophecies. Many go back and study the history, even the Protestant Reformation, so they might understand why knowledge would increase. Knowledge could not increase if you had not took the Bible off the dead languages of Latin and put it in the language of the common people. Father, we thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for such a high priest who can identify with our infirmities, who was touched in all points with our weaknesses, touched in all points like we are tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. And you said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Lord, thank you that you can identify with our trials, with our shortcomings, with our heartaches and our headaches, with our loneliness, and sometimes with our waywardness at times. But Lord, we thank you that we can have a clean heart tonight. We thank you that we can have forgiveness of sin tonight. We thank you that we can live a new life tonight. We thank you that we can have victory with, over the power of the Holy Spirit through your righteousness over sin tonight. We thank you that the plan of salvation is sufficient and Christ has sufficient power to give us power that we can do all things. We can overcome every sin, word, thought, and action if we will bring our lives in conformity with thee and bring our minds into captivity to the will of Jesus Christ. We thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' name and for his sake. Thank you for this Advent movement and thank you that we can have this study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, at this time, we just pick up an offering. Uh, I invite you guys to come on back tomorrow. This is time well spent, right?